Welcome to the fun2000.com real estate podcast. My name is Chuck Ham, and today in this episode, we're going to discuss smart shopping for real estate agents and for lenders. First, let me um, explain our conflict of interest here. We're giving information about the business we are in, but because we're in the business, we're qualified to give this information and do it better and uh, more competently than you might hear otherwise. And also, this is where we're strong, and that is in shopping around for lenders and real estate agents. We try to be competitive. We think it's a competitive market. On the other hand, um, some people think that there is a monopoly, which does in fact exist in especially the real estate agent market. And uh, I'll explain that a little bit. The thing we're going to talk about the most today is the fees and documents involved in the process. I'm going to split this up into two different segments because I've received some professional advice on this podcast, um, which is that sometimes I talk too long about a topic or various topics and I don't give the listener a break. So we're going to break it up. First, we're going to discuss how to shop for lenders and then uh, we'll go into real estate agents on in a second segment. So first off, how to shop for lenders. There are different kinds of lenders and you should research the different kinds of lenders that there are. Um, you have bank lenders. Uh, those are your Bank of America's, Chase's and Wells Fargo's credit unions. But then you also have mortgage brokers and that's what our office does. Um, I, I, I'm partial to the mortgage broker model and that's because uh, we do it obviously, but also because uh, as a broker, we can shop around to various different investors. Uh, banks, they don't shop it around to different investors. They are the only investor and they're offering the one product that they offer for whatever type of program you're trying to get into, be it a VA loan, FHA loan. Sometimes they don't even offer uh, some of those products that would be best for you. So uh, that's why I like the mortgage broker model. Um, when you're shopping around for lenders, keep that in mind. A broker can shop around different types of programs for the loan that would best fit you and also different investors uh, for um, to get you the best rates and lowest fees. You have also uh, online lenders and direct lenders. They call themselves direct lenders, but um, that's, I think, kind of a misnomer. Uh, they are still a lot of times working through brokers or through the same kind of channels that mortgage brokers work through, um, and they're charging the same fees, if not more. Besides shopping around for the types of lenders, you also want to compare the interest rates and the loan terms. You have different types of interest rate programs. Now, that's separate from the um, different types of loan programs that are out there because you have, as far as loan programs go, uh, government-backed loans, which are uh, conventional VA, FHA loans of various types. Conventional loans, sometimes people think those are strictly private loans, but they're not. They're getting sold on a secondary market that it has um, some quasi-governmental uh, involvement. And that's because the instruments securing the loans are sold on the secondary market and the uh, government either insures them or in some cases buys those loans. So compare interest rates and loan terms. Uh, you have fixed rate loans and you have adjustable rate loans. You have 15 year loan terms, you have 30 year loan terms, and we're starting to see more uh, 40 year loan terms as well. Then also be sure that you know about prepayment penalties. Most loans don't come with prepayment penalties except for that first six months. Um, but even then you might not have a prepayment penalty but the idea is most uh, loans are given in on the assumption that you're not going to be able to pay for the subject property with other funds within at least six months. So they uh, and they don't recoup their fees and their full investment until after six months. So um, keep in mind that there is an expectation, even though there might not be a prepayment penalty, um, but there is an expectation that you keep the loan for at least six months. Evaluate your lender fees. Lender fees are regulated by the government. At least the disclosure of the fees is regulated. So you can ask for 
uh, documents called loan estimate, or it used to be called a truth in lending and good faith estimates, but now we have what's called a loan estimate and a closing disclosure. Those documents are the same, um, whether you from loan to loan to lender to lender, from broker to broker. Um, we use the same documents so you can compare them side by side. Uh, the lender fees that you're going to be looking for on that document are your origination fees. If there's any credit, uh, if you're being charged for running your credit, if there's any application fees or underwriting fees, if you're being charged for discount points, you want to ask for all that information and you want it in writing. So try to get that on a loan estimate. There are situations in which it's kind of hard to give a loan estimate because maybe you haven't, as a borrower, completed an application yet. So um, it, when we don't have a complete application as a lender, we're not able to give you a um, complete loan estimate with completely accurate loan fees and estimates. But if you're not getting straightforward answers on straightforward things such as how many um, points do you charge? What is your origination fee? What do you charge for credit reports? Um, are there underwriting fees? If you're not getting straightforward answers on those matters, then I would change lenders and keep shopping it around. So, um, but basically look for those four things, origination fees, uh, application fees, underwriting fees, discount points. Maybe it's five because I'm uh, suggesting also credit report fees. So again, um, request a loan estimate. In fact, it is um, a statutory obligation uh, of a lender that once you submit a completed loan application, that within three days of submitting that application, you get a loan estimate. It's, it's a required disclosure. So you wanna look that loan estimate over. It's several pages long, but the first few pages are the ones that have, like most important documents, they have the most important um, uh, information on the first few pages. And then you can compare loan estimates from different lenders. You'll compare the interest rate, the note rate. What is the interest rate you're being charged? And then there's another interest rate that you want to look at. It's a different measure of interest, and that's the APR, annual percentage rate. And that takes into account the note rate in addition to all the fees that are um, charged in association with the loan. And the way you are able to look at those different figures is by comparing loan estimates from different lenders. Next, you can negotiate. Uh, you can negotiate fees and rates with lenders. Um, sometimes it's uh, not a huge negotiation process. You can just let one lender know that you're getting a particular rate at such and such uh, broker or bank and uh, that gives them the opportunity to try to match it or to, to beat it. And a lot of times we're, we're able to do some kind of a negotiation. Um, but uh, one thing that as a broker we do is we do that for you. Um, we have, uh, when we're pricing a loan for uh, an applicant, we look at different investors and we say, hey, um, we like your loan program, but it's the, the rate's not as good as such and such investors. So can you match the rate? so that we can get these other benefits that you're offering to uh, my particular client. And uh, a lot of times they're able to do that. Fees charged for processing the loans, and th those are called processing fees. You'll see that also on the loan estimate document. Ask your lender if they're using a loan processor and how much they're charging for that. A lot of times that's a lot of money. It could be $2,500, it could be $1,500, it could be $500. It's, it, I've seen them all over the place. And the thing that I don't like about it is it, that means the, your broker and your loan uh, officer, they're outsourcing the, the work that's involved with um, processing the loan, collecting the documents that underwriting is um, going to require for your loan to be approved. And a lot of times these processors, they're no good and you're charging, <laughs> you're, you're paying a lot of money for all this um, loan processing uh, fee and um, they're the ones making you crazy because they're not doing a very good job at asking what the loan underwriting department actually needs from you. So the processor is kind of a go-between person that works for the mortgage loan broker or the lender or the loan officer. And um, if they're going to charge you that money, they better be very good. But our office doesn't charge any money for loan processing. And that's because we try to be the least expensive and best quality. We, we find that when we outsource certain services that are client-facing services where 
if we outsource those services that the client interacts with the most, and that's the loan processor, then we lose on quality of service and we end up charging more for less service. And that's what I think uh, the industry is doing with the loan processing. And um, I think there's a parallel there with real estate agents too, and I'll get into that in a little bit after the break. All right, next, how to shop for real estate agents. Our office also does real estate sales and we are agents and I am a broker. I've been doing this for almost 20 years and um, I have agents that work for me and I've been doing my own sales, like I say, for almost 20 years. So I know how to shop for real estate agents, just like loans. That's every single transaction has all of these elements. And um, one thing that I found over the years is that um, people believe, and it's true, that realtors, members of the associations of realtors that are all over the country have a monopoly on the MLS and listings that are on the MLS. And therefore, um, listings that are on the MLS or, the, or multiple listing service, um, they tend to monopolize the fees that are charged and uh, they try to set the rates for uh, commissions. These fees are the commissions. So um, the, the rule used to be when home prices were lower, about 6% real estate commission, which would be split between the listing agent and the selling agent, 3% to one and 3% to the other. And as a broker, I would collect the full 6% and I would pay the 3% to one agent and the other 3% would stay with uh, my office and I, if I had an agent working for me, then I would um, pay a split of that commission to the to the agent that um, was working for me um, in, out of my office. But uh, now that home prices have shot up so much over the past 20 years, um, the, most of my career, the average is usually 5%, um, so two and a half and two and a half. But, you know, you don't have to go with the bigger brokerages that are stuck on those uh, fees and those commissions. The bigger brokerages would not exist if it wasn't for highly inflated real estate commissions because of all these splits and all these agents that are collecting a cut of every single transaction. So what I found is that you can shop around for discounts. You can shop around for less commissions, whether you're um, about to sell a property or you're about to buy a property. And um, most consumers are pretty savvy. They're already aware of companies like Redfin and others that automatically um, rebate or refund some of the commission at closing. And that's been going on for some time. And because of that, my office has been do going, doing that for some time as well. And that incentivizes us to keep our um, quality of service high because we're automatically better than the bigger brokerages um, and the discount brokerages like Redfin, just because of the years of experience that we stay in the business. And we're able to do that because we are, um, we run much lower overhead. My uh, office expenses are much, much lower than the big brokerages and um, the agents that work for me, they get much higher commission splits and they have um, great incentive to stay in the business and, um, and they get, uh, excellent training and supervision uh, from our office to be able to help them through every single transaction. One of the best recommendations and one of the sources of the referrals that we get in our office is when you're shopping around for a real estate agent, ask your friends and family, who did they work with and did they like that individual? It is a highly personal service. You want to get along with your real estate agent. You want to make sure that they communicate with you in the way that you need communication. If you're not big on texting and you like phone calls better then you don't want an agent that's just going to be texting you all the time or emails. If you don't like emails, on the other hand, if it bothers you to get too many phone calls uh, because you're busy at work or whatever your situation is and you rely on emails, you want to make sure you have an agent that is going to accommodate that need. Ask around, ask your friends and family. Um, Maybe uh, you need somebody that does Spanish and uh, you want to make sure your agent um, habla español como nosotros hablamos español. Um, you can read reviews 
online resources. This is all pretty obvious. The less obvious thing is you can interview the agents. You can get to know them a little bit by talking to them. Maybe test them out on a particular uh, showing of a property before you decide if you're actually going to hire them or not. Meet them in person and see how they present themselves, if they're knowledgeable, ask them questions about uh, your concerns about your particular transaction. You also want to see if your agent is familiar with the local market. If an agent's not familiar with the local market, they might they might miss important things. Maybe there's important disclosures that are um, associated with um, a, a particular market. Um, a lot of times that I've, I've found in doing uh, coastal real estate transactions is agents don't know anything about the California Coastal Commission. That's a local issue. And if you um, are buying property that's on the in the coastal zone, you want to know how the California Coastal Commission can influence um, or even restrict your ability to develop the property. And uh, that affects the value. And if your agent never tells you about it and your seller never, never tells you about it and you're not aware yourself of this uh, particular law in California, then you're going to miss an important um, fact related to the marketability, the value, and the use of, of the land. So next, under, try to understand the agent fees and commissions. Um, agents, like I said, charge a commission, and that is going to be um, pretty much dictated usually by the broker. Now, that's why uh, when you work with a smaller brokerage like ours, um, you and you have access to the broker and a broker who is willing to allow discounted fees and commissions, um, you you get that potential. There are some brokerages that, that also uh, charge their own clients additional fees and costs uh, with every single transaction. So there might be some kind of an administrative uh, fee, um, some kind of a processing fee. It's different than the processing of a loan. Um, sometimes they charge um, for a transaction coordinator. And you might want to ask your agent if they use a transaction coordinator and ask if there's any um, transaction coordinating fee that gets passed on to you as a buyer or a seller. And if they are using a transaction coordinator, ask them if you're going to have to be talking to that transaction coordinator because then you should be interviewing two people instead of just the agent. Transaction coordinators are usually less experienced. They're not often, they're often not even licensed and they don't know the business. And what I've found is a lot of agents also don't know the business and they think that in order to help them through the parts that they don't understand, they can just hire a transaction coordinator who's not even licensed. And uh, they're paying for that service and they're relying on that uh, transaction coordinator to perform a service that they themselves are not wanting to do for some reason. Well, again, to me, this is not the way to do business. Um, this is the client facing service uh, that the agents should be doing themselves. They should understand, most importantly, the transaction coordinator work. And what is that work? Well, that is the management of the documents that are related to the transaction, the contracts. The, um, so the agents, a lot of times who hire transaction, co transaction coordinators, they perceive their job as representation only and negotiation only and um, sales only, but not the the busy work that has to do with uh, getting the documents signed or sometimes in, in some cases understanding the documents themselves. And I think that's a big mistake. Um, getting the documents signed, that's where the clients have questions. They want to know if um, what certain things mean on certain documents. They want to understand what they're signing. And uh, they don't want to have to sign everything that's presented to them sometimes. And, and what I found is transaction coordinators and agents, they just follow a, a um, checklist that they use on every single transaction when really the checklist um, for what documents they assign should be different for every single transaction. Um, and that's because the contract is different for every single transaction. The buyer and the seller, they have different needs and the negotiation goes differently on every single transaction. There's only a few things that are the same on every transaction and that is going to be, for example, your purchase agreement, your statutory disclosures, statutorily di required disclosures from the seller, and uh, a few other things maybe, but um, 
the the transaction coordinator aspect of the real estate agent business is something that I disagree with quite a bit. I think it compromises the service that agents should be providing and it also inflates the price of the service. And I think this is a creation of brokerages that um, they're trying to keep uh, fees high and keep agents in sales and I think it's a mistake. When I personally um, take on new clients, I don't use transaction coordinators and I deal with my clients directly on pretty much everything. There's a few things where I might not be able to show up and be physically present. Maybe that might that might be at the showing of a property, but even at the showing of properties, I try to be there personally. I try to handle all the phone calls. I try to handle um, all of the important client interactions. So next, can you uh, negotiate a commission with an agent? Well, the, the agent does um, not have the ability to set their own uh, commissions unless they are also a broker, but they can talk to their broker and uh, they can uh, negotiate a reduced commission. And um, I would recommend trying to get a, re a reduction. Maybe a lot of, for a lot of our clients, I uh, end up crediting back a lot of our commission towards closing costs. It is a very expensive market. Real estate transactions are not only expensive because of the price of the property, but also because of all the commissions and because of all the costs and other fees that are involved with the loan um, and title insurance, escrow companies. Everybody's got an interest in, in getting paid uh, um, from these transactions, so it does get expensive. So I think you can uh, negotiate something and we welcome you to always talk to us about um, what we can do for you and we will uh, we'll make an offer. We'll, we'll, we'll do our best for you and you'll still get the best service that you can get. Dual agency is one of the um, situations that you ought to be very careful about in this um, part about understanding agent fees and commissions. A lot of times the bigger brokerages especially, but I would say everybody is guilty of this. Um, I wouldn't say that we're guilty of this, but we do it. Um, we do it when we fully disclose the uh, conflicts of interest of dual agency. Well, so what is dual agency? It's when you have one agent representing both the buyer and the seller. It's a little bit of a misnomer because can an agent actually represent both? And the answer is no. Under the California Civil Code, if you have a dual agency situation, really what you have is a, a one agent who is acting as agent and coordinating for both parties and there is no other agent, but the agent only owes a duty of loyalty to one of the parties because they cannot be loyal to both. There, there is no possibility to be loyal to both a buyer and a seller. So what happens is uh, the agent is hired um, by one. It depends on who is actually hiring the agent. And then the um, other party is not hiring that agent, but still working with that agent. How do you navigate these conflicting duties? Well, you don't really have conflicting duties once you understand the um, California code and, and the, the way this works. So if you're the seller and you hire a, an agent to list your property and then you have a buyer that contacts you directly that has no agent representing them, um, they might say, can you reduce the price a little bit or give me some incentives if I don't bring my own agent? And as the agent, you'll, the agent will, will contact the seller and say, here we have this buyer, um, you can save about two and a half percent by using this buyer. What can we do for them um, if I represent both of you? And then the seller will say, well, wait a second, or the seller should say, well, wait a second, can you possibly represent that buyer and me at the same time? And the agent should say something like, no, um, I, my loyalty will be to you as the seller because you hired me. My duty to the buyer is only a duty of honesty and fairness. Um, and that's how we uh, avoid conflicts of interest there because we have to disclose up front to everybody that the duty of loyalty is only to one of the parties, in this case, the seller, and there's only a duty of honesty and fairness to the buyer. And that it, it can work out, but I would still recommend against it because um, the agent, instead of really negotiating for their seller, it compromises their position, I think it compromises their loyalty. They're trying to keep a deal together because 
maybe they maybe he's getting a fatter commission based on the dual agency so it it's different in every situation but um, I would say don't always expect that because you're not hiring a second agent that you're actually saving yourself money if you compromise the negotiation aspect of it by not having a second agent negotiating on your behalf and understanding the transaction to know how to negotiate on your behalf then you probably aren't really saving yourself that much money even if there is some kind of a discount um, for not having that second agent involved what are some of the fees and costs involved in home buying well we've already talked about the lender fees um, now let's talk about some of the real estate agent fees. You've got commission rates and how they're split. I've already gone into that. We, it's usually 5% split in half. Um, I do it differently. I try to give my client um, the best rate possible and I try to um, break it down in a way that helps them see that they are getting something that's much better than the big brokerage, um, uh, the, the big brokerage fatter commission that they would have to pay through somebody else. And then of course you have closing costs. If you are a buyer or a seller, you're gonna have some costs of the transactions that are allocated to you either as a buyer or a seller and your agent is responsible for showing you what those are. And that's when the agent should also tell you if there's going to be a transaction coordinator or any other um, administrative or brokerage related fees in addition to just the escrow title and commission costs, uh, lender costs and that kind of thing. They should be able to tell you what those title and escrow fees are going to be. Those are they know those up front. They're going to help you choose those service providers. They should also be able to tell you what the government's going to charge because there's recording fees, um, transfer taxes, um, and request a closing disclosure. Usually, your escrow office can uh, provide a closing disclosure, which incidentally looks very much like the uh, loan estimate, but it is. Um, a more accurate is it is based on what they know the real costs are going to be so in conclusion um, shop around for your real estate agents and shop around for your lenders and contact us let us be one of those people that applies for the job of giving you the best service the best loans best rates and um, take take your time to make informed decisions even if you don't hire us we won't feel bad about it uh, we'll be happy to, to volunteer lots of free information and uh, thanks for listening to this podcast today.